her, her mother is would point out what she sees and so on. So this is Jackie. This is Gramercy people. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful to be here. And I had the privilege of being with mom, my mom Sharon, uh, when she looked at a number of cooperatives and she had her heart set on Gramercy. Right. And it happened. Right. Yes. So it's been a wonderful, wonderful move for mom. And we have a couple family members here. I think I'll introduce in age uh, youngest to oldest. <laughs> uh, my daughter Casey, grand granddaughter of Sharon, <laughs> is here. And Sandy, who is our, our family member, she's we've been friends since two years old. Oh, not a long time. <laughs> and then next to uh, Sandy is Larry, uh, mom's uh, brother-in-law. And we won't say how old he is, but they've been together a long time. <laughs> and then uh, mom's sister, Auntie Barb, my Auntie Barb, her youngest sister, Barbara. <laughs> So it's wonderful to be here and to introduce my mother. You know, I just grew up with thinking that everybody painted and did artsy things in their house. We had an old house with not much to fill it with, and Mom filled it over the years with with artwork, with antiques, her love of antiques, and it was absolutely just a beautiful, aesthetically pleasing place to grow up. So um, with that, I know Mom's excited to tell you a little bit about her background and some of her work. Okay, thanks, Jackie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to she's going to point to something or put it in the air. Yeah. Because I have other artwork here as well as watercolors. I hope I won't bore you to tears. If you want to just get up and leave. <laughs> Sandy, quick, close the door. <laughs> <laughs> but I will tell you a little bit about my love of history and how I got up of history of art and how I, it says art history here and I bring it up just that. Anyway, as a child, going to kindergarten in first grade, you're always holding a pen or a pencil. I can't ever remember not drawing something with it. It was just like innate. I loved doing characters. I loved seeing, in fact, on a Sunday morning, I look forward to the newspaper, the local town newspaper, and I could hardly wait for those comic books, the strips to come, because I would tear it out and I could sit at my table and I would draw all the characters. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, this was in the 40s, so there wasn't a lot of money, but my mother was able to get me a little paint tray. Do you remember those old oh, yeah. Yeah. colors? <laughs> and they really were great for watercolor, but for a kid at five years old, that was good enough. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, so then I was a very bored student in school because all I wanted to do was draw. And if I was a great student, I just didn't care for school. But I would get through with my assignment, my assignment, and then my daughter has right by her, if you want to look at some of my stuff after, I used to take any kind of scratch paper I could find around these things. You know, you couldn't go out and buy tablets like this. So you had to use a back of a school paper. Some of those are back of elder bar, uh, uh, sheets. And I would draw whatever I felt like doing because it was study hall. And I was finished. So what I do? And so anyway, you can put it's it down on me, But if you want to look, it's just sort of what I did. It was a scrap of paper. I found it and I drew on it. Okay. And then during, during the 40s, in grammar school, art was not high, high on the cur cur curriculum, curriculum level, excuse me, curriculum level. Reading, writing, and arithmetic were more important to an able one to get a job, we were told. Now women were supposed to prepare for three jobs that could be available to women. Secretary, a nurse, and a teacher. Right? Yeah. 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 Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I was quite been talking, what does somebody like me do? I want to be an artist. Well, I did I did go to the library, I spent half of my life at the library, but you don't find books like that. You find books that just talk about history and so anyway, secretly I was determined to pursue the arts. At thirteen years old, I don't know if you ever remember that there was something called Draw Me and Contest in Paper Magazine. And so secretly behind my folks' back, I cut one out my ear, and I did just what they said. I drew this figure, a profile of a lady, and I have a lot of people, obviously, in my picture. And I sent it in. And I thought, well, I don't know if I'll ever hear from these people. 
folk type. It was in Chicago. Anyway, one summer day, I was sitting at my house with my mom and dad for some reason. I wasn't out playing or anything. And a, a strange, un, unidentified car pulled up in front of our house. I grew up in Edwards, Minnesota, a tiny little town with miles and miles from here. I didn't, didn't even know there was something like that. Anyway, so this lady came out walking out of her car with a briefcase. And I noticed her license plate was Illinois. And I thought, well, it's interesting in a town like Evelyn, uh, only relatives come with an out of state license. This was the, probably by then it was the late 40s. I was 13, let's say, so that would have been, you know, a little bit before junior high. I was doing junior high. So anyway, she came in with this briefcase and introduced herself and told my folks that I won this contest. Oh. Oh. Yeah. I was so excited, my heart was just pumping. And then they, my folks asked the critical thing, well, how much is this going to cost? So smarter than I was. They, well, they probably knew it was some kind of a ruse to get your money to pay me to go to art school. Well, she did lay out all the figures that they couldn't afford. I was the oldest of five children. And my new baby sister and brother had just come into the family and they couldn't afford to send me to art school. And as a nice <coughs> girl, I couldn't say anything. And I, she put her suitcase, her briefcase back together and I walked her out to her car and she said, keep it up, you've got potential. I'll never forget that. No. I was starting to cry, didn't tell my folks. By that time, mother was making dinner and my dad was down in the basement in his workshop. My life was over. <laughs> so then life went on, and I took as many art classes as I could in school, but you just get so far. So after I graduated from high school, I became a medical stenographer in a local hospital next in Virginia, Minnesota. In fact, a couple of Virginia people here. And um, at that time, I had high school sweetheart. So I thought, well, I can't go to college. My folks can't afford anything. So I'll just work till we get married. And then I'll be a stay-at-home mother, a homemaker. And just like I'm reading from this on TV, do you remember years ago, they said when women started getting uh, to be more popular and working, going out to work, they'd say, I'll bring home the bacon. That was a cigarette hat. But I was told by my husband when we got married, that I will just be a homemaker and he's going to bring home the big And then I married and had two children and I was determined if I couldn't be an artist, I would be the best wife and mother I could be and the best hostess. So I read a book and it was called, it was on entertainment. What was that lady's name? I can't, I sure know what to do. Amy Vanderbilt. Emily Gross. Pardon? Amy Vanderbilt. <laughs> no, it, it, it was the etiquette lady. Oh, oh, you Gloria. Oh, you Emily Post? Emily Post. Yeah. Emily Post. Oh, yeah. 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 I'm sorry. I, I yeah. didn't hear. I yeah. didn't hear. Yeah. Yes, Emily yeah. Post. So anyway, and so she taught me that in order to be the perfect hostess to entertain party of, you had to entertain a dinner party for eight people and act like you had never done a thing. Then finally, finally, with my children not needing me every minute of the day, I decided to uh, enroll in junior college in Italy in any art class I could take. And so that's how I started. And most of my life, I considered myself a, a struggling artist. Not a starving artist, is just struggle to find the time to do this. And I would paint into the wee hours of the night. My daughter can tell you that. <laughs> I, I, as I raised them, I decided I could get along fine with five hours of sleep at night because I had to get everything done in the house, make sure lunches are ready for the morning. And then I would just sit up and paint, and, and I loved it. And I started out in acrylic. Well, because that's what college offered at that time. I didn't like acrylic because acrylic was, um, I, it, I, it was just too easy. 
and I needed a challenge. I liked to challenge them because with acrylic, I could put a so color on a page, and if I didn't like it, what's wrong, or I made a mistake, I could cut it over and white and do it again. Well, I didn't, there are no rules in acrylic. I have to do, uh, get tired of acrylics. I did it for about maybe six, seven years, I don't know. But then I fell in love with it. <laughs> <laughs> And some of um, Mom's early acrylics are in this book. Yes. There's a couple of cute little books. Should we pass it around? We've had them in our home, as I said. Many of us still have the early works of Sharon yes. <laughs> in our home. So this is really sort of a, a nice um, progression of your, your skills as an artist, Mom. Yes, I have to keep everything, of course. Uh, but, so that was my struggle, just finding the time to paint. And, and, and like, we, we just have to divide our time with everybody. Anyway, I have to tell you, my daughter's over there to tell you that during the time I was raising the children, I did get into other arts because all art uh, appeals to me. So I went to um, a college and I learned how to bat tea. And I, I, this is a little sample. And when you bat something, I, I had it on my in my. Um, I decorate the elevator lobby and on floor seven, and I had a huge one there. And I, I think I even brought one to the aesthetics when you are of an angel. But it's it's a piece of cloth material. I would used to go to rummage sales looking for cotton sheets, but we didn't have polyester a lot then anyway. But it has to be pure cotton. And what you do is you cut to whatever size. That's yeah, just a text or a test piece I did once. And um, the real big one with three butterflies is in my apartment. And then you have to decide what kind of design you want to make. And then you co cover that design with wax. And after your waxing is nice and dry, then you dip it in any color dye you want. You have to have the water dye already mixed with water, you know, things like that. And so then the big secret comes. Everything, everything is dry now. The dye is dry, the wax is dry, and now it's time to see what you actually need because it, it'll transform itself because then you put your piece of cloth in um, between two towels and you iron off all that wax. It might take an hour. It's very tedious. But the ending project is fabulous because sometimes you don't know what you're going to get. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's my bad team. Yep. And the other art I have is decoupage. I bet a lot of you have decoupage. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty yep. common for a while. But I got so good at it that college then asked me if I would teach decoupage at community ed at night. And I remember when I decoupaged a piece for you, and I, I think everybody in our family had a decoupage because once you're an artist, you want everybody to share your, your excitement. So, but anyway, that is a picture. It's an antique picture. Um, I used to because of being an antique dealer, also in the summer when I was up there, um, I would get these old antique magazines that were falling apart, but I would see what I thought was a pretty picture. So I pasted that with decoupage, you just get a nice firm piece of wood, and you glue the picture on, whatever you want, and then you start varnishing it. And that probably had 30 coats of varnish. Well, you have to, mm -hmm. you have to let it dry overnight. Wow. And, and, and you, the edge. you never, you can't, you're not it's done like if you can finish, if you can feel the paper. Like if I did a wedding, and then a wedding dry, announcement or something, or somebody's anniversary, you have to dry the that sort of yeah. thing, you have to make sure there's yeah, enough yeah. coats of <coughs> varnish. And you, in between every coat, you have to let it dry thoroughly until the next day. And then you sand that all down. And you're sanding with steel wool but fluorot steel, which isn't abrasive. And then finally, finally, after 30 coats, you're ready to have your paint <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd just throw that in because it was part of my love of art. I still have mine, and you gave me with the teddy bear on it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. Okay. The other thing I have to tell you, I was instrumental in doing, it, has everybody heard about the blueberry? Festival of Ely, Minnesota. No, never been up there. No. Okay, well, it's I've been doing it for 17 years, so or 23 actually, I think. I lived with somebody else for 23 years. <laughs> 17 years. <laughs> then 23, I was there. Okay, 
in Ely, Minnesota, at the last week in July, I think, is there any Last week? Yeah, weekend. My mm -hmm. said it's, in Ely. it's always the last week, and it's <coughs> wild up there. They have a beautiful park, and it's called the Blue Bear Art Festival. Well, in 1976, my group of arty, artist friends and I decided we'd start Art in the Park. I think that might have been a centennial year, 76, if I'm not mm -hmm. So we decided we'd go into this park that nobody was using and we would set up our displays of whatever we painted. I also told painted on anything that didn't move. <laughs> 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 like milk cans and um, anything that anybody wanted me to do. I, I did a lot of consignment work for people. But anyway, that I have a picture of me too somewhere in my albums where I, I'm standing there holding a big poster that we made to put up all over Ely that this, this art fair was happening. Well, that morphed into the Blueberry Art Festival. Now thousands of people I've been um, with at least, um, tell me, a hundred, at least hundred tables. So oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's the start of it, our little old art group. We had 12 of us who would work together. And if you want to go, you need to get a room right about now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Number one, it's an uh, artist was me sitting under a palm tree while we were vacationing in Tulum, uh, Mexico. When I married the second time, my husband was sort of an amateur photographer, and I was often his subject. And so we have pictures of me and everything practically about it. That was in Tulum, and I absolutely loved it. But that's when I was trying to learn how to paint uh, palm trees, and that's a little different. Shirts, white work. And that this also is under a regular palm tree that we're known for in Florida. <coughs> and that's just me standing there looking at the ocean. Actually, we lived off the Gulf of Mexico and it was so beautiful down there. I would, that was my favorite thing to do was just go outside, sit on the beach, watch the water, watch the dolphins. We had fabulous dolphins. We lived in Fort St. Joe, Florida. If anybody's familiar with the panhandle, it's by Destin and uh, Panama City, New Mexico Beach, and then you get to Port St. Joe. We actually were in the Eastern Time Zone because a DuPont had, um, uh, they used to do work in, at uh, Port St. Joe, and they wanted the trains. It was really interesting, very good history down there. Port St. Joe is this tiny little town that had a train service, and it all went to the East Coast with what the log and stuff they were sending them. And they, they actually, Port St. Joe actually uh, vied to be the capital of Florida in like 18, like 1839. And it lost because it plagued me through and it ruled all of Port St. Joe. And so we found it home, it was wonderful. So we lived actually in the Mexico, or uh, in the, um, Oh, <laughs> in the panhandle. Yeah. So we had uh, Gulf of Mexico on one side and a bay on the other. It was paradise, that's all I can say. It was just the best. Oh, I always say everything's the best uh, units of my life, so that's why. <laughs> anyway, then the white fish, that's a beautiful picture because of the art teacher I had. Um, that was done, what I did living in Florida, <coughs> I went to many workshops, which would be a whole week starting at nine, ending at four or five in the afternoon. That is grueling when you're trying to take a great picture with a great artist, a teacher. 
And so the koi fish uh, was painted with, uh, I painted it, but with the help of uh, a Chinese artist who came to Florida, St. George Island, maybe some of you have heard about St. George Island, it's very famous. Lian Quan Zen, he comes right from China to St. George Island in Florida and teaches people how to paint in these workshops. He was fabulous. It was my best picture at that time that I painted and my granddaughter over there, I got home to Minnesota with it and she turned it around and put her name on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that book you wrote, what are we gonna do with mom's stuff? I'm like, I'd like this picture, please. I'd like that picture, please. <laughs> Florida was really starting to bloom. He had a different house 